address today, depending on how far we get with Detective Quinn. So it's something that could come up by Friday, but we would like defense counsel to review it. And if they have any edits, let us know, because the state would be intending to use that transcript. Okay. Mr. Adams, anything, anything further? Um, we'll go ahead and we'll review it. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, and you're right, sir. And I think that the state's telling you they're, they're going to potentially ask the court to go ahead and consider the transcript. They're asking you all to review it for accuracy um, and edits. And, of course, I'll take, I'll, I'll accept any other objections at that point in time. And if I should decide to give the or play the tape with the transcript as an aid, I'll give a, the uh, applicable Uniform Superior Court rule um, at, uh, tape and transcript um, instruction or admonition, okay? We'll go ahead and we'll review that. Okay, all right. Anything else? Nothing else. Okay. All right, let's summon our jurors, please. Uh, You had your own hotspot? Um, I take it from that. Um, that I've always had trouble with my own hotspot. And, and I would just suggest that redundancy is always a good thing. I don't know how the, how the um, public Wi-Fi here is in the courthouse, um, but we have added a, a hotspot right. for, you, for you all's use only. And that's been working until today, at least in my experience. Well, did something's you, happened today that it's gone I, down. I, you know, I'm, I, I can't, I can't tell you why. I can only make a phone call, yeah, and that's all I'm asking. that then, and I can, I can maybe inquire about that. So, Mr. Kearns, can you call Miss um, Omana and the appendix and see if we can check on that? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, Mr. Steele. Yes, sir. Was that it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sharp? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. I said, I don't apologize. I don't know the context, so I don't know um, the objection to be made, but we playing a recording that has been played already would, in my opinion, be cumulative, and none of the speakers are here. But again, I don't know why Let, that would come up. So yeah, let's see, let's see what the state offers it for, and uh, I think that's a little premature at this point in time. I was just answering because I heard you say any other objections. Oh, I, that's at the time that you all have the, the, the uh, have an opportunity to take a look at the transcript. But if the tape's played, depending upon the foundation, depending upon what it's issued for, I'll make a determination at that point. And then can we just approach for about 40 seconds on a map? Okay. Are they good, uh, Pam? Okay, all right. Well, just tell them to get ready, okay? All right.
All right, thank you, Deputy Ham. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <laughs> Members of the jury, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, sound good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, we're going to continue with the presentation of the state's case. So, um, ladies and sirs, I'll call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls retired Detective David Quinn. All right, summon Detective Quinn, please. All right, Detective Quinn, good afternoon, sir. Morning, Judge. Afternoon. Good. All right, come on up to the witness stand, sir. And before you sit down, if you would be so kind and turn and face us, Deputy Hamm, be sworn as a witness. Raise your hand. We swear in front of the testimony, sir, but I'll get a floor of the truth. I hope you're nothing but the truth, sir. I do. You may be seated. Can you state your first and last name and explain them both, please? David Quinn, D A V I D Q U I N N. And good afternoon. Um, how are you employed? I'm retired. What are you retired from? The Atlanta Police Department. And how long have you been retired from the Atlanta Police Department? Uh, fully since 2019. Okay. And when you say fully, what does that mean? So, I joined the Atlanta Police Department in 1985 when I was 20 years old. And I stayed until 2019, so I did 33 years <laughs> and uh, some change. Um... Uh, after that, I got into the uh, true crime TV business, which is what I do now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and tell the jury a little bit about your um, time with the Atlanta Police Department over those 33 years. Again, I, I hit the street when I was about 21 years old, 1986, uh, after having been hired at 20. And uh, I went straight to Zone 3. I don't know, Zone 3 is, was back in those days, Southeast, Southwest Atlanta, I stayed there 10 years in probably the highest crime district in the city at that time. Uh, after those 10 years, I don't know why, somebody sent me to Bankhead and I went to the Zone 1 precinct and I worked there for another five. In my 15th year, after working those high crime areas, somebody promoted me to detective and they sent me straight to homicide, which sent me right back to those same neighborhoods in Zone 3 and Zone 1. It's like going home. So. And let's talk about your 10 years being in Zone 3. Um, did you have the occasion to patrol the entire Zone 3, or were you assigned to a particular um, section of Zone 3? Well, I was assigned Zone 3 A sector, which was that area around the McDaniel Glen Housing Project, the Pittsburgh Civic League Apartments, Prior Road. But there was a lot of bleed over. In other words, I wouldn't just work one specific area in the downtown Atlanta. I would also branch out as far as Gilbert Road, which is at the county line to Clayton County. So it was the busiest precinct at the time. So you, you kind of scattered all over. Okay. And you said it briefly as a homicide detective. Did you unfortunately have the occasion to investigate homicides within the Zone 3 neighborhood? Absolutely. Every month, usually. And based on your time in Zone 3, if you could describe the Zone 3 community for this jury. Zone 3 in community, from the time that I worked it in the early, in the mid-80s, all the way until I was an old man in, you know, the late, two, the mid-2000s. It's a rough, busy neighborhood, but there are pockets of diversity everywhere. You may have truck drivers, you have doctors, lawyers, but you also have the quote-unquote marginalized communities are also in Zone 3. So it's, it's a mix. It's not one thing. And based on your interaction of having different type of community members within Zone 3, um, how would you describe the residents of Zone 3? Um, the who? The residents. The residents are hardworking people. Um, I grew up out there with them. I feel like, you know, I am Zone 3 because uh, I saw so many different generations get raised up out there. And um, I feel like I, got, I was only 12 as a boy, you know. And when I, when I left, I was a, a grandfather, so okay. that was my life. 
Now, I'm going to take you back to your time as a detective in the homicide unit. If you could tell the jury, what were your primary job duties and responsibilities? When I went to homicide, um, I learned quickly that my responsibility was to investigate crimes that involved deaths at the hands of other humans. I had worked murder. That's primarily what I worked. I worked uh, with about 20 other, about 18 other detectives, and we were in a rotation. Whereas you would catch a homicide, respond to it. You'd have about a month to work that case up. And once you've worked that case up, you would go down to the bottom of that homicide list. But you also, they were given us the responsibility to actually handle cases that involve special investigations. In particular, police officers' use of force shooting people, uh, uh, anyone that dies in custody. We handle those investigations. Sometimes we even handle corruption investigations on the department if, in fact, there was some kind of conflict in internal affairs. So speaking specifically about um, having to do those special investigations, specifically the officer-involved um, investigations, what were your job duties and responsibilities for those type of investigations? Well, I had to investigate whether or not an officer had the legal authority to use his gun in, in a deadly way. I investigated deadly force. And to your knowledge, is that responsibility of investigating officer-involved um, shootings still the responsibility of the homicide unit? You know, when I was on the way out, uh, it changed gears. Uh, they decided to let the Georgia Bureau of Investigation handle those shootings. I, I guess they didn't want the actual agency to investigate itself. Somebody say something. I think your honor, I said objection, speculation. I will objection. When you are assigned as um, in an officer, when you are assigned an officer involved shooting, excuse me, if there is an underlying crime that occurred before the officer involved shooting, um, do you investigate both the underlying crime and the officer involved shooting, or do you sep or, those, or excuse me, are those two separate investigations? No, you you have to work both. You've got to understand the reason why the officer was there in the first place, why he pulled his gun, why he used deadly force. Uh, sometimes it's not involving a weapon. Sometimes it's physical force. So you must also investigate that crime as well. Now, in your experience as an investigator, do all investigators investigate cases the same way? Oh, no. It's just like any other walk of life. I mean, you, everyone has their own style. And usually your style comes from how you carry yourself in the street. And your experience out there with the citizens, in this case, the citizens of Fulton County, city of Atlanta. Tell us a little bit about your investigative style. Everybody calls me old school. How old were the objections, Mr. Steele? I am Atlanta, and I feel like every case I work is a story. And I've got to report back, you know, the information from that story. Uh, I always say, uh, when I work my investigations, I want to have on a belt and suspenders. I want to make sure I got everything. And sometimes, you know, commanders and supervisors don't like that. I mean, I take my time slow and methodical with how I work my cases. I don't, I don't move very fast. Faces. I overrule the objection, Mr. Sharp. Thank you. You could say. That's pretty much it. I just try to keep, you, you don't get all the answers when you work in investigations like they do on TV. But what you, what you do is you try to get as much as you can and you miss things. I miss things on every investigation. And so you have to take your time to make sure you have it right. When you're conducting an investigation, generally what type of evidence are you looking for, say for your homicide cases? What type of evidence do you want, um, are you trying to gather as a part of your investigation? I mean, first and foremost, I want eyewitnesses. I want humans to, to give information that could lead to some kind of inroads in closing this case. Um, as I got older in the department, technology became a useful tool. We've always had fingerprints. You want fingerprints. Uh, DNA became a really big deal around 2002. I've watched it, everything change, but I always, with any kind of testimony that I receive from a witness, I want to get something to back it up, something tangible that will vouch for this person that's an eyewitness seeing something. But I really, I really like eyewitness evidence. A lot of people don't, but I do, because the community, that is the witness. 
Now, um, in your time as a homicide detective, have you had the occasion to interview suspects? Absolutely. And tell the jury a little bit about your um, interview style. I try to keep my interview... Objection, brother. rule, Mr. Sharp. Have a seat. I try to have conversations. I mean, from these conversations, I try to have them make sense. You know, I don't want it to be overbearing. Uh, sometimes those conversations, those interviews can get heated. But you want to you wanna <laughs> build some kind of rapport with the person, whether it be a witness or a suspect, and make sure you're getting good information. Uh, do you have an objection, Mr. Steele? What's the basis? All right, come on up. My procedure, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Let me ask you this, Detective Quinn. Over the course of your 30 years, how many people have you interviewed? Just roughly. I mean, thousands. I mean, I can't even give, I can't put a cap, I can't, I can't put a number on that. Okay. And you talked a few moments ago about building rapport. Tell the jury, why is it important to build rapport? You don't want your interview to be adversarial. You want people to be calm and give you truthful testimony that you can verify later. 
Mr. Chair, you got to pose an objection and then you got to tell me a basis because selling your honor doesn't let Ms. Weaver know who you are. So please go ahead and objection and tell me your basis. I have a motion. I have a motion. All right. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, can I get you to step into your headquarters for just a second? Detective, can I get you to step outside for a minute? Ladies and gentlemen, our jury has left us and our, our witness is off the stand. Yes, Mr. Steele, what's your motion? Your Honor, I tried to preempt it at the bench. It's exactly what I asked. And, and I'll wait for Ms. Weaver if the court needs it for the exact quote. But Detective Quinn just said, Upon questioning the district attorney, why is it important to develop a rapport with a witness? And the answer was something to the effect of to get truthful information. No witness, no witness can talk about veracity or truthfulness or believability of anybody, of anybody. That's what I tried to say at the bench. That's the entirety of this testimony so far. I'm moving for a mistrial on Mr. Williams because this gentleman interviewed a big witness in this event. The only witness that puts Mr. Williams involved in this event. And now it's important to get truthful information. I don't know how you wipe that out. Are you going to tell the jurors, ignore that last comment? That's what you're going to say? And I warned it. And I was at the bench, and, and you did not want to hear from me more than you did. You told me to step back. But, Your Honor, I, that's, you know, I've been doing this too. I anticipated it wasn't that hard to do. I'm moving for a mistrial. And I did it at the proper moment. All right. Ms. Hilton? Your Honor, um, in, oh. Have a seat, Mr. Sharp. Let her finish, okay? I would love to just join this. All right. Remember, the Harvey rule is still in effect, so have a seat. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, as it relates to um, Detective Quinn's response, he did not talk about a specific witness, truthfulness, or veracity. He said, in general, what I'm trying to do is to find the truth. And that is what you do in an interview. You're determining whether or not what the person who's speaking to you is credible, if they're providing credible information. Your Honor, even in this case, when you listen to the interview that has already been admitted, Ms. Um, Detective Quinn already tells Agent Bain, I don't think you're being fully honest. So he's not talking about the veracity of any one witness. He hasn't even talked about any witnesses yet. So for defense counsel to deem or ask for a mistrial at this juncture, given this testimony, um, we're going to ask for you to deny. All right. Um, I'm going to deny the motion. Summon our jurors, please. Um, Your Honor, before the next question is asked, I have to renew my motion for mistrial. It's noted. I'll make a con that? Yes, and I'll preserve that. It'll be, conti it'll be continuing. Mr. Shard, if you ask me that one more time, okay? <laughs> No, I did. I, I listen. Everybody, everybody gets the same objection, okay? Unless there's something else. Your Honor, previously you informed all defense counsel that motions for mistrial were not subject to the Harvey rule. No, I didn't. That's why I'm doing this. No, if I you didn't. tell me that we are, motions for mistrial are now subject to the Harvey rule, and that's on the record. I, 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 I don't recall my saying that they, they were not, so. Respectfully, I recall that, but I will just rely on the Harvey rule from now on, if that's clear for the I'll record. assume it for everybody, then, let, unless, you, unless you opt out. Thank you, Your Honor. And just in case there's any about the prior uh, testimony or the prior arguments that were made for a uh, motion in this trial. My understanding from the court's ruling today is that it applies to all defendants. Yes. Thank you. All right. Summon our jurors, please, sir.
I don't want you touching my microphone because uh, that, that's the exclusive purview of Miss um, Miss Weaver. Okay. <laughs> so. It's okay with her. Then you have you have carte blanche. But short of that, leave it alone. Sir, would the court consider my re previous request for a continuing objection now in the same bolstering? Yes. Irrelevant? Well, I'll just give you a continuing objection, okay? At this point. All right, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Deputy Ham. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Seated. All right, you may continue your examination, madam. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Detective Quinn, in your interviews with citizens or with suspects um, or residents of the community, do you curse or use language that some may deem offensive? I would think, yeah, my mother in, in particular. Uh, <laughs> and has that all, is that just your style of talk and speech? Yeah, I mean... That's just how I talk, and um, I think it's more like the vernacular of the area that I worked in all, the, all those years. I want to direct your attention to September 11, 2013. Were you assigned to the homicide unit? I was. And did you have the occasion to respond to 2745 Old Hapeville Road, Atlanta, Georgia, Fulton County? I did. And did you arrive with other officers? I did. Do you recall now who you arrived with? Well, I was riding alone, but other homicide detectives went to that scene. Uh, you had Detective Vince Velasquez, who's my longtime partner. You had uh, Detective Summer Benton, my soup. Is that me? You had um, a contingent of other support staff. Again. It's really ringing in my ear big time. I don't know what it is. Hopefully it should finish it. Okay. Loud. I don't think I need it. Call because I was told by dispatch that an officer discharged his weapon and I need to get to that scene. And while you were responding to 2745 on the road, did you learn that there were other areas um, that were active scenes at that time? Absolutely. Um, how many other active scenes were there? It was, it was about three. Uh, you could almost say four, but three that were going to be necessary for that investigation. They were going to have to, they were going to, have to be uh, processed. Now, what were those reasons? So, 
you had 2745 O'Hareville Road, which is the Summerdale Commons Apartments. There was, what I was told at the time, that's where the incident occurred where the officer discharged his weapon. Then you had a house directly across the street from there where there was damage to a residential home right there on O'Hareville Road. And then you had a third scene, which was 126 Cleveland Avenue, which the Cleveland Coin Laundry, a car had crashed into it. So I had a bunch of scenes going. And roughly, how far were each of those scenes from each other? Uh, they, they were within about 75 yards. If you, if you just do the whole perimeter, it was, it's kind of disjointed, but they were all kind of right there. You may. You've shown that uh, document to defense counsel, yes. correct? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Marcus, Stacey said the 158C. Sure. Um, did you recognize the 158? This looks like the area I just described, roughly, yeah. And is that a fair explanation of an overview of that area you kind of described where you responded to on September 11, 2013? I would say so. Any objection to states 158, Charlie? Anyone? No, Your Honor. All right. States 158, Charlie, is admitted and maybe published as you see fit. Yes, ma'am. You can either do one of two things. You can go old school, like you like to say, old school, and point, or you can use that computer. I'll let you decide. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I think I'll do the finger action over here. Okay. So if you can click to the left, it should pop open to the bottom. Just tap the screen. All right. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, you have a pen over there to the left. Right here. Yeah. That should give you a pen. Can you circle on there? Do you see where it says Summerdale Commons? Or Summerdale Parks? <coughs> Commons first. Uh, wow. Hold on. And then um, Summerdale Apartments? Uh, wow. <coughs> and 
on here where it says the Skyline Laundromat. Are those the three, roughly the three areas that you just kind of described for <coughs> where you, those three active scenes from? Yes, ma'am. All right. <coughs> describe to the jury, what was the scene like when you got out? It was like opening day at Six Flags. It was crazy. I mean, it was fire engines, police officers, blue lights going. Uh, Everybody talking to me at one time, you know, which, which I'm used to, but this was this was a really big scene and it was really active. And once once you got there, what did you find? What did you observe once you uh, responded to the process? When I got there, I wanted to speak to my supervisor and just try to figure out you know, what, what was I dealing with here? Give me an overview. Uh, the first place I pulled up to was 126 Cleveland Avenue. And 126 That was the coin laundry. And when you said you spoke to your sergeant, who was that at the time? That was Sergeant Leanne Lacoste. And um, was she able to provide you any information uh, at that time about what was happening? She gave me an overview of what was going on and indicated, I, you know, where I needed to go next. And did you follow her instructions? I did. After speaking with Sergeant Lacoste, did you ask any homicide detectives to assist you with taking I asked two. Okay, who were those two? I asked Detective Vince Velasquez to actually go up to 2745 Old Hapeville Road at Somerdale Commons and work that scene, whatever it may be. I then asked Detective Summer Benton if she could handle the 126 Cleveland Avenue. I mean, we had a car, a car that had crashed into a building. I wanted her to handle anything related to that evidence. And did you yourself know anything? Well, when I went up to 2745, there were shell casings all over the ground. I don't remember how many it was at the time. Uh, clearly evidence of a shooting. There was a disabled front gate. This really nice mechanical gate had been destroyed, and it looked like fresh damage. Um, and I wanted Detective Velasquez to take his time and go through that and, and, and report back whatever, whatever his findings were. And was he able to do that for you? He was. Now, while you were on the scene, were you made aware of any individuals that were detained? I was. Okay. How many people were detained? Three. And who were those individuals? Uh, I was told that it was a Frederick Prothro, uh, Walter Murphy, and an Adrian Bean. Out of those individuals, were you aware of any of them had injuries? Oh, yeah. I found out that uh, Frederick Prothro had a serious gunshot wound to the back, which changed my thinking. I mean, I, we had someone who was actually struck. So a lot of my energy went to that. I also found out that it was Walter Murphy had gunshot wounds to the legs. They had both been transported to Grady Hospital for treatment. Um, to your knowledge, did you know if Adrian Bean had any injuries at that time? I heard he had some injuries, but I didn't think they were significant based off what I learned on scene. I wasn't even sure at the time if he went to the hospital. And you said that uh, when Mr. Prothro and Mr. Murphy went to the hospital, what hospital did they go to? Great Memorial. And um, did you have any investigators going to Great Memorial Hospital to speak with or uh, Walter Murphy or Mr. Prothro? Yeah, I have my partners, Detective uh, A.B. Calhoun and Detective Tracy Lewis. They would go down there and try to see if they could give me some feedback on what kind of injuries I was dealing with. I was really concerned about the brother that was shot in the back. They said the brother. When you say the brother, what do you mean? I'm sorry, Frederick Propro. And did you, did you interview anyone while you were on scene? I, yeah, I did. Okay. Who did you interview while you were on scene at 2745? Uh, this young man by the name of Flores, uh, and I interviewed the actual officer that discharged as well. Did you interview anyone else? Um, I actually interviewed, I, I didn't really interview, but I actually, uh, there, was, there was a young man by the name of Skateboard. Did you remember his, did you ever learn his actual name?
Brian Taylor Ransom is what I found out his name was. Um, when you met with Investigator Robinson, uh, um, do you remember where you actually met with him? So because this was a major scene, they pulled out all the stops. They brought out what's called the mobile command vehicle. This is an air-conditioned camper where they put the officer that's been involved in the shooting away from everyone. And when I walked into the camper, this mobile crime unit, he's in there with his lawyer. So I was, you know, his union lawyer, the officer. And was he able to provide you information that um, assisted or helped you with the investigation? <clears throat> he gave me some understanding as to why he discharged his weapon. Uh, we agreed on scene that uh, he would come back the next day with his attorney and give a formal statement at the homicide office. And after speaking with Investigator Robinson L, um, did you determine that there was an underlying crime that you need to investigate and was it determined if he was justified in uh, firing his weapon? There was a, a shooting that uh, prompted uh, Detective Robinson L to discharge his weapon, as he told me. Uh, at that time, it was only an aggravated assault type investigation. We didn't know what else it may entail, but he responded to gunfire on a citizen. Um, you said you spoke with someone named Flores. Does the name is Juan Flores sound familiar? That sounds correct. Right. Um, how were you first made aware of this situation? Um, Sergeant Leanne Lacoste told me that. Uh... I'm sorry, he's in How's Mr. Steele? Oh, I'll, I'll sustain the objection. Let me ask you this. Were you just made aware that this witness is the chief's office? Yes. <laughs> and was he one of those? Uh, yes. When you were first made aware of this third knock for us, how long had you been on scene with you involved? I've probably been out there about 15, maybe 20 minutes, because I was walking around at each scene. That's an estimate from 10 years ago. To your knowledge, did any other officer speak with him prior to you? Somebody did, but I don't remember the name. Uh, Whoever spoke with him, do you know they recorded <coughs> that first interview or that first interaction? I didn't know any of any recordings with him other than what I did. And when you interviewed with him, was that your first time speaking with him? Yes. Uh, oh. Do you recall, do you recall oh. where on scene that, where on scene did you interview him? I interviewed Flores at the 126 Cleveland Coin Laundry, right on the hill overlooking all the car, all the mayhem down there at the bottom where the car crashed. You may, as long as you've shown that to the defense counsel, right? Yes, I have. I'm showing you what's going to mark the state's exhibit 159C. If you can take a look at the exhibit 159C and tell me if you recognize uh, that area that depicts the exhibit 159C. Uh, this looks pretty much like the Cleveland, 126 Cleveland Avenue uh, location where the laundry was. And in that picture, do you see the approximate area where you were when you began speaking with Mr. Donald Flores? Uh, yes. And would that picture help you describe to the jury what you were telling when you actually had your conversation with Mr. Donald So I'm, I'm between this white utility box in the picture and the driveway in that area. So looking. Will, so will it help you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you I'm sorry. Your Honor, this time I'm saying like the, um, and then say something to 159. Any objection to one states 159, Charlie? Not on behalf of this court. All right, hearing no objection, uh, the court will admit 159, Charlie. It may be published as you see fit. Thank you.
You know, I'm proud to go back to the stick. That, that confused me. Where's the stick at? I'm in this area right around here where this cracked sidewalk is and this utility box. And when you met with him, did he approach you or did you approach him? Uh, he approached me. He came up to that scene. I mean, everything was cordoned off. And some kind of way, he got into the scene. And <coughs> someone had to have escorted him because you couldn't just walk in. Everything was, was wrapped up. You couldn't do nothing on Cleveland in 75 that day. Um, was your interview, did you record your interview with him? I did. How did you record your interview? His interview? Um, my digital recorder. And where did you keep your digital recorder? I keep my digital recorder right here in my lapel pocket. I'm, and I, that's what I've always done. And do you generally record all your interviews in a pocket recorder? Yes. For the most part, yes. And why do you um, record your interviews? Well, a couple of different reasons. I want to have all the information that's coming to me on that scene so I can come back to it and reference it as I continue my investigation. Um, I'm just big on taping things. There are times when I'll actually take a verbal and write notes. Everything's not recorded, but in this case, his interview was recorded. Okay. What was his demeanor like when you interviewed him? Uh, he was concerned about his vehicle that he had uh, received from someone else. As an investigator, have you ever had the occasion to interview anyone who was under the influence of drugs or alcohol? I mean, throughout my career, almost every day. <laughs> Did Mr. Nava Flores appear to be under the influence of any drugs or alcohol when you um, met with him? Not at all. He was clean. <laughs> Did his eyes appear to be glossy as if he was high or anything like that? I didn't see it. <laughs> was he able to speak with you coherently? Clean as a bell. When you first met with Nava Flores, were you aware if he had given a different version of his involvement in the case to another officer? I did hear that. And based on your interview with him, did he advise you um, what he told that initial officer? Yes. Did he then advise you that the version he was telling you was now, in fact, what he had actually... I, I sustain the objection. Your Honor, this time I'm impeaching Mr. Nava Flores from what his testimony is. Do you have your witness on direct, ma'am? So you don't need to ask. Was he able to tell you about what happened on September 11, 2013? He was. Was he able to tell you why he was over at Cleveland Avenue? Yes, ma'am, he was. Was he able to tell you who he came with on Cleveland Avenue? Yes, ma'am, he did. Was he able to tell you um, why he was in the Cleveland Avenue area? He did. Was he able to tell you whose car he was in? He also told me that. What about what car, who he gave the car to? Yes. Was he able to tell you if other people entered the car that he had given to someone else? He did. And was this entire interview captured on that audio recording? Absolutely. And have you had the opportunity to listen to this audio recording in preparation for your testimony here today? Yes, ma'am. Permission to approach your room. Have you shown that to the defense counsel already? They received this, Your Honor. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 160C. Tell me if you recognize State's Exhibit 160C. This is the uh, Eduardo Nava Flores interview. It's even got my initials on there. And, what, uh, and have you had this opportunity to listen to that interview again in preparation for today? I have. And did that appear to be the full interview that you had with Mr. Nava Flores back on September 11, 2013? That's it. Your Honor, this time the state would like to tender State's Exhibit 160C into evidence. Any objection to State's um, 160, Charlie? On behalf of Mr. Wood. All right, hearing no objection, uh, 160C is admitted, and it may be published as you see fit. Thank you, Your Honor. One, 160C. You're welcome.
This is Detective D. Quinn. The date is the uh, 11th day of September 2013. I'm currently at the intersection of Macon Drive at Cleveland Avenue. For the record, sir, what is your full name? My name is Eduardo Flores Nava. All right, Mr. Flores Nava, give me your date of birth, please. It's February 2nd, 1990. Okay. Now, we've been working a crime scene over here involving an officer-involved shooting. You just walked up minutes ago. Explain to me why you walked up here. The reason I walked up here was because I had word that my car, my girlfriend's car that I had borrowed this morning, might be down here in the street. All right. Now, we're looking over the, the ridge here. There's a wrecker that's loading a car on. Is that... Nissan Altima, burgundy in color, the car that your girlfriend allowed you to use today? That is the car. All right. Can you tell me anything about the car, anything specifically on how it may have arrived up here? Uh, the only way I can think of is that we were... Who'd you give the car to? That's all I want to know. I did not give the car personally to anybody. Okay, well, who did you allow to get your car? Brian, my friend. He's the one that pointed me this direction. He's the one that had pretty much... Me here thinking that I was just going to grab... Maybe. Okay, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. Ryan has told us that some guy asked to borrow the car. You let him borrow the car. If we keep going around this circle, we're no, going to have a long night. Let's sure. have a yeah, short sure. night. I'd like to go home and get a cold Peroni later on after this is all over. So tell me and describe the person, if it's true, you lent the car to. Right. That's simply, that's, that's all I want, so we can let you go. I don't want to interrogate you no, and sure. do the hot lamps. No, yeah, right, 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 Let's no. get it done now, brother. Right. I got pointed this direction. I was lost. I actually do not know any of these streets' names gotcha. whatsoever. I buy that. Right. And he was pointing me the directions. I trusted him with the car. He said, can I borrow your car? Yeah. I've let him borrow a car, Brian. You let Brian borrow. Where are you when you let Brian borrow am, your car? I have just exited the door at what direction that the officer just Now, got. Sergeant Swartz just took you down to 2233 Macon Drive. Is that where you were when your car disappeared? That's where I was when I was disappeared. I was in the car. Who did park. you give the keys to? Brian. You gave them to Brian. Do you know who Brian gave the keys to? Brian handed them over. Four people got in the car like this. Who's the guy you saw Brian give them to? I don't remember, sir. Can you describe them? Scattered. If it was any of the guys that I just described, it was the guy with the white T-shirt and the short hair. Was it short hair? It was short hair. Shorter than mine or short as mine? It was probably as short as right. yours. Okay. And if anything, so if anything, what do you do now after the car's been lent out? I think Why about did, it. Wh who, asked to, who asked to get the car? Brian. Okay. And he turns around to me and he says, it's cool. It's cool to let this guy borrow the car. Did you right. know where he was going with the car? No, but whenever four black people jump in my car in the middle of Atlanta where I don't know where I'm at, I don't think so I... So how many was... black people got in your car initially? There were four. You saw four get in your car? Yes, there were four. Okay, they were all males? They were all males. Okay, four black males. And you've described... And now at this point, whenever they're in my car, I'm not trying to say nothing. I'm not, because there's still some people at the house. I don't know where I'm at. Obviously, this guy knows his cat, and he's doing him a favor because he supposedly, he said, he just needs a favor. He needs to go down to the, to the store, do something. Do you I'm know the guy be... he lent the car to? I have no Have idea. you ever been around him before? Never. Okay, all right. Anything else inconsistent? Uh, anything else in that first statement? That you'd like to clear up now, now that we're here. Yes, that, else? Uh, that the gas station was just somewhere where he was looping me around, saying that we might find it. So you never went in a gas station? Never went in a gas you station. You only went to 2233 Macon? Right. After that, from the gas station, he pointed me to 23 Macon, pulled up, got out of the car. He started talking to him. I kept my sub because I don't know these cats. Did you I, see any firearms at all during this exchange of the vehicle? I did not. If I would have probably seen some firearms, I would have told them from those 20 minutes that we sat there waiting for the car to get back, mm -hmm. I would have told them, look, Fuck that. Why is there a cop rolling by this, this house now? Okay. okay. It wasn't but three minutes, four or five minutes after that that the cops were just bailing down that road. Gotcha. And gotcha. I, the guys that were there didn't say nothing, but they had this look in their eye like, you know? And mm -hmm. they looked at each other. And to me, it was just like a gut feeling. That so like, what prompted on. you to leave to come up here to Old Hateville? Someone and, uh, rolled man. by. Someone rolled by and said, "What the fuck happened? Something just happened. They got the whole road blocked off." Blah, blah. And then they started honking at them. They left, and I said, "What?" And then they started calling. And they're like, "Hold on, hold on. They, we don't know about this. We don't know about this." Yeah. And they just said, "Like, yo, we have no idea if it's even our people or what." You know, okay. You came up to investigate 
You see your girlfriend's car that was just right. I was I was walking and I couldn't find my way all the way up here because every cop that I saw, only way I could find it is follow cop lights. Okay, and that's how I got all here. Right. I just want your buddy. And, right. And since I was here, the only the only reason I was saying that is because he said that we went to the gas station and I'm like, look, I don't want you to get your buddies in trouble or well, I don't know what kind of condition uh -huh. you got down here. I'm gonna tell him that we were at the gas station. This is what happened. All right. We left. All right, but, all right, all right. But you, you, this is the absolute truth, this second interview, right? The second interview is absolute Okay, truth. we're done, man. It's that simple. All right, ending time is 2.32 in the p.m., 9-11-2013. And was that the entirety of your interview with Mr., um, and I said Nava Flores incorrectly, Mr. Flores Nava? Yes, ma'am, it was. And... After this interview with Mr. Flora Navas, did you have any additional interviews with him? I did not. Okay. And was this your only recorded interview with him? Absolutely. At any point, have you ever erased any part of this interview regarding Mr. Flores Nava? Not at all. Now, I want to go back to Stacey's at 159C. Oh, sorry. One on 58. 58. Okay. Looking at Stacey's at 158C, um, do you see roughly the area or making drive on this particular map? Hold on. Right up in this area up here. Okay. And roughly... Not that you knew exactly where he walked from, but is that roughly that area of Macon Drive where 2233 um, or 2233 Macon Drive was roughly over in that Macon Drive area? Oh, uh, yeah, give or take. I mean, it's probably a block or two down from where you got the blue dots. Okay. Block or two, which well, not way? a block or two. Uh, I guess headed towards, um, was that Mel Burton? Would have been maybe in the middle of the road down there. Oh, wait, hold on one second. For this um, bar. If you could show us again roughly where. I would say in this area here somewhere. Okay. And on the same day, on September 11, 2013, did you also have the occasion to interview um, a Brian Ransom? I did. And was he able to provide you information that assisted with your investigation? He was able to, yes. Now, looking at 22, excuse me, after speaking with uh, Mr. Nava Flores, did you, or Flora Nava, <clears throat> did you ever go to 2233 Macon Drive? Yeah, I wanted to go there and see, you know, get a, get a, get a feel for what he was talking about, where he came from. And while you were down there, um, did you see or speak with anyone? I did. Um, who did you speak with? Uh, Miss Courtney Bean. And to your knowledge, who was Courtney Bean? Uh, she told me, well, she, she was the wife of uh, Adrian Bean. And what, if anything, did you say to her about the investigation that you were currently working? I was working a police shooting, and um, I had some questions about her husband's involvement. Okay. Now, on September 11, 2013, did you canvas the area? I did. And what does it mean to canvas the area? But, you know, I had a lot of things going on. So I've got Velasquez doing the crime scene at 2745 O'Hayville. I've got uh, Summer Benton. She's down there grinding at the scene at the laundromat. I got people at the hospital. What I wanted to do next was to get and knock on the doors of the people that actually live at the complex where the police shooting originated. And so it was during... The afternoon hours, you strike out during those times of day a lot of time. I still want to knock on those doors to make sure someone didn't hear or see something I could use in this investigation. And after camps in the area, did you get any information that assisted you with your investigation? It was sparse. I mean, I knocked on like 18 doors that were in close proximity to where Velasquez had been working his scene. Uh, people heard shots. People heard what they believed to be pops, things of that nature. That was good for my pad, my notepad, to, to know what I was dealing with. But I had no clear-cut witnesses that saw <laughs> anything uh, pertinent to the shoot. Now, after Cameron's in the air and speaking to witnesses, did you inspect any of the vehicles that were involved in the shooting? 
I did a visual inspection of that uh, burgundy Nissan that was rammed into the laundromat. Okay. And did you see anything of note or of evidentiary value within those vehicles? Within yeah. that vehicle, excuse me. Yeah, this, this burgundy Nissan that crashed into the laundromat, because I got a detective on it, I was doing a quick peek. I saw a firearm in the front passenger floorboard area. I saw two more automatic firearms in the back seat right behind the driver and the floorboard. It was bloody cash on the ground, um, significant damage to the front of the vehicle. Um, and so at that point, I was going to rely on my detective, uh, Benton in this case, just to kind of give a deep dive into that scene, and she would get back to me. Um, outside of seeing the gun in the passenger seat and the two guns in the back seat, did you notice any other ballistic evidence in the car? Well, I saw what I believe to be a hole in the headrest of the front seat, a uh, passenger. Now, I don't know if it was old or new, but there was a corresponding busted out vent window on the rear passenger. So my experience is telling me uh, a bullet probably came through here and went through that headrest. Okay. And, and at, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, that was it. And at that time, did you do anything to determine whether or not there was a path at that time on September 11, 2013? Not at that time. I just need this detective to work that scene for me. I was going to, in my mind, go back in a controlled environment and probably rod out the hole. When I say rod out the hole, I was going to take something looks just like this Stick it to the hole and see if it corresponds with that busted vent window in the back rear passenger side. And then take a picture of it. But I was going to do that later. Let me ask you this. Um, when you canvassed the area, you, you talked about people who noticed or heard some things. Did you take those people's names down and notate that for your records? Yeah, I, I put their names down. The ones that answered the door, they gave me their names just to show that I was there. Uh, Jotted down some notes of what they may have seen or heard. I'm sorry, heard, because I had no eyewitnesses. Okay. And let me ask you this. Um, during your investigation, <clears throat> did any patrol officers, detectives, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, anyone um, from Zone 3 or any other department ever advise you of any surveillance footage from the laundromat um, that had any evidentiary value? No. During your investigation, did Detective Summer Benton, who you assigned to process um, 126 Cleveland Avenue, ever advise you that a patrol officer, detective, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, or any major from Zone 3 or any other department um, gave her any information about surveillance footage from the laundromat um, that had any evidentiary value? No. Now, after... Um, Going to the scene and interviewing individuals at the scene, did you ever interview anyone else um, not at the scene? Yes. Uh, who? Derek Dotson. Where did you interview Derek Dotson? I did it at the homicide office that same day. And what was his demeanor when you interviewed him? He was lucid, he was clear. Uh, he gave, in, he gave me information uh, about what happened to him. Okay. Was he able to tell you, and don't tell me what he said, but was he able to tell you if money was taken from him? Yes. Yeah. You're right, I'm asking if he was able to tell him that, not what he said. I'm over, I'm over the objection on both the grounds, Mr. Steele and Mr. Sharp. You may answer the question, detective. Was he, uh, able, was he able, not what he said, but was he able to provide that information? Yes, he was. When you interviewed Derek Dotson, to your knowledge, uh, did Detective A.B. Calhoun observe that interview? Yes, he did. With Detective Calhoun, um, to your knowledge, was he responsible with inventorying that money that you said was found on the ground outside of that red car? He was. Okay. And after um, you spoke with Derek Dotson, was Investigator Calhoun able to tell you how much money um, he inventoried? Yes. How much money did he inventory? 
$970 cash. And you're around Detective Calhoun did testify previously. Now, during the course of your investigation, um, did you have Detective Velasquez assist you um, in interviewing a Detective A.C. Booger Higgins? I did. And as a part of your investigation, did you learn a description, excuse me, was A.C. Booger Higgins able to give you a description of, let me back that up. What was your understanding of A.C. Booger Higgins' role in this investigation? Her role was she was in the car occupied by Detective Roberson L, who was a front seat passenger, and uh, another detective by the name of Paul. Yes, Mr. Steele.
Ladies and gentlemen, how about a comfort break? Let's take about 10 minutes, and uh, Detective Quinn will go ahead and let you take a comfort break as well. Don't discuss testimony anybody except the attorneys in this case. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you back in 10 minutes. All rise. All right, I'm sure.
Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Detective Quinn, when we left off, um, we were getting ready to speak about um, Detective Booker Higgins, but before I do that, I'm going to show you what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 108C. When we, we reference Derek Dodson, that's the individual that you met with at the homicide unit. Yes. Well, mine is the black screen across his face. I recognize. <clears throat> Just okay. Now, going back to Detective Booker Higgins, um, what was your understanding of her involvement in this case? She was on scene at the time when uh, Detective Robinson L. discharged his firearm. Right. And when you had Detective Velasquez speak with Booker Higgins, did she provide a description of a driver of the, uh, of the vehicle that was involved in this incident? She did, yes. Okay. And what was the description that was given? To, what was the description that was given? She gave a description. Hold on. Yep. Your Honor, Detective Booker Higgins has already testified, so it's not here. So. Oh, okay. so I will overrule the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead. What was the... She said it was a female driver. Okay. And did that female driver have any particular hair color? I think she said pink. I'm not really sure. I can't remember okay. exactly. But... Now, at this point in your investigation, mm -hmm. were you now looking for a woman as a part of this underlying um, assault that you were investigating? Absolutely. Now, during the course of your investigation, did you also have the occasion to interview a Leonard Pass? I did. Okay. And was he able to give you information that assisted with your investigation? He did. All right. Now, permission to approach? Yes, they should have seen these already in discovery. And I believe I sent them to them previously, Your Honor. These are definitely all in discovery. From the crime scene pictures. Yes. I do. And how do you recognize this has been 111 and 112C? That's the area that um, that I had a photograph. I had a, a crime scene tech come out and take pictures. That's actually that's my left hand pointing to a little dot on the ground there. <laughs> um, and is that a fair accurate depiction of um, the image or the area that you had? <laughs> I'm a crime scene tech, take a picture of back in September of 2013. Yes, ma'am. Um, Your Honor, this time I say like 10 or 16, but 110 and 111 to evidence. Hey, I mean, and 112, I'm sorry. Excuse me, 111 and 112 into evidence. All right, any objections to states 110 and 111? No, okay. no. 
And it's 111 to 112, Your Honor, my apologies. I stage 111 and 112? Yes. I stage 111 and 112 were admitted and published. Thank you, Your Honor. You can publish. I'm going to actually first start with what has already been admitted, State's Exhibit 110C. Looking at State's Exhibit 110C, do you recognize what's in State's Exhibit 110C? Yeah, that's, that's Somerdale Commons. Okay. And now looking at State's Exhibit 111C. And looking at 112C. Um, you, is that your hand that you were just referencing that's pointing at? something in the ground. That's me. Yeah. What exactly were you pointing at? at that the ground? was what was believed to be impact from a projectile from a gun, a bullet. Now, during the course of your investigation, did you ever attempt to speak with um, yourself, either Frederick Prothro and Walter Murphy? Yes. And were you able to speak with them? Uh, no. During the course of your investigation, did you ever meet with um, the owner of the red car that was used in the armed robbery? Uh, yes. And if you can recall about when in your investigation did you meet with her? I know it was a couple of weeks after, I'm gonna say the latter part of September 24th or 25th maybe. Okay. And, and I said her, do you recall what her name was? Maricela Cisneros. And was she able to tell you um, information about her vehicle? Was she able to give you information about her vehicle, specifically who she had let borrow her car? She was. Okay. Now, during the course of your investigation, I think you told, talked about earlier um, going to do the rotting of the vehicle. Yes, ma'am. Right. Um, did you ever actually do that with the car? I did. All right. And when did you do that? Do you recall? I don't remember the date. Uh, I know it was within the week. I had the car sent to what's called the homicide cage, a protected area we put vehicles in for further processing. Uh, my, my goal was to understand that hole in that passenger side front seat headrest. Did you, when you processed the vehicle, did you, um, or did the rotting in the vehicle, did you find any shell casings within that vehicle? Uh, I did not. Mr. Stewart? And understanding what you knew at the time that you processed your vehicle, was that a surprise for you that you did not find any shell casings inside the vehicle? I mean, it wasn't a surprise. I mean, shell casings are fickle. You don't know where they're going to go. You don't always find them. Okay. In a moment, I'll be showing some pictures that I've already shown the defense counsel, but I'm re-showing to them again.
Permission to approach, Your Honor? You may have. I'm going to show you what's already been shown in the Pennsylvania Capital System 161 through 174 C. If you could take a moment and look through 161 through 174 C. I'm looking at 61161C through 174C. Do you recognize those pictures? Yeah, that's that uh, burgundy Nissan Altima that was in the homicide cage. Thank that you. I wanted to get those rides through. Okay. And is that, are those pictures of the vehicle at the homicide cage? Uh, yes, ma'am. And the, do those pictures appear to be a fair and accurate depiction of the car at the homicide, at the homicide cage when you went to process or do the rod out of that vehicle? Uh, yes. You're right. This time to say like the 10 or 60s, but 161C through 174C into evidence. Any objections to say 161C through 174 C? Any objection? Okay. On behalf of Mr. Lloyd, I'm hearing no further objections. Approval 161 Charlie through 174 Charlie. And maybe policy. Thank you, Your Honor. Looking at Stacey's Exhibit 161C, if you could just orient the jury as to what we're looking at in um, Stacey's Exhibit 161C. This is just a front view of the car that made impact with 126 Cleveland at the coin laundry. And let me ask you this. Um, how does the car get from the coin laundry to the homicide cage? Um, a record. Okay. A C contracted record service. And is that the record that you were referencing or talking about when we listened to the Nava Flores interview when you asked him, is that the red car on the record right there? Uh, yes, ma'am, it was. All right. Now, um, going to 162C. Um, is that appear just to be another angle of the vehicle inside the home? That's the question. What's in Stacey's number 162C? Uh, it's just the front end view of where that vehicle made impact with the larger map. All right. 163. Uh, that's the rear trunk compartment of the same vehicle and a rear view. All right. And looking at 163C, is the top of the trunk on the car? The actual roof of the trunk? I don't see where it is. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Looks like it's just off. Looking at 60 164 C. What are the jurors looking at 164 C? This is that area of concern for me. Again, I'm investigating the actions of a police officer using deadly force. That's what my mind is. That vent window, the rear passenger of view is what I'm concerned with and how it may correspond with that headrest of that front seat. I got a man shot in the back. I got to explain that. Okay. And looking at say, exhibit 165C. That's a closer view of that same rear passenger vent window. You can also see the airbag deployed from the driver's side. 166C. That's another view. We're getting closer. You can see that defect to the right side of that headrest. That's my area of concern. That's a through and through hole, and that was a paramount concern to me at the time. Now look at 167C. That's gonna be the rear passenger compartment of that Burgundy Nissan owned by Mrs. Cisneros. Um, you can see blood transfer. Um, there's some items on the floor. Now, at the time, did you request for any testing or anything to be done with the blood that was in the backseat of that vehicle? Uh, not the blood, no. Why not? I didn't, I didn't think it was... I mean, I knew I had a shot person in the backseat, so I wasn't going to send off to the GBI to make sure that was blood. I mean, they don't... They don't you know, anyway. All right. 168C. 
What are we looking at 168C? Well, this is a very rudimentary, you know, not very scientific. It's just a brother taking the stick. That's all I did. Uh, and running it through that hole. Because I'm trying to tell this story. I'm working this deadly force case. And I want to make sure that that was going to be a path of a possible bullet fired by the Atlanta police. And at the time when you're doing this, did you have information of the officer shooting into or in the direction of the vehicle? Based off his statement, the way he broke it down, I had pretty good, pretty good idea exactly what happened. Okay. Looking at Stacey Exhibit 169C. What are we at looking at Stacey Exhibit 169C? This is going to be an interior view of the same information, uh, those rods. I've actually got them now going through, showing the trajectory, which corresponds with the wound that the 6'8 Mr. Frederick Prothro had to his back. Thank God the brother was 6'8, or it would have been in his head. And outside of that bullet hole in the vehicle, did, did you notice any other bullet holes within the vehicle? I, I did not. Okay. Um, looking at Stacey's event 170C. It's another cl closer view showing the trajectory. Uh, that hole where it originates at the rear of that headdress, it's actually coming through. And I believe that is the wound that Mr. Frederick Prothro received from the Atlanta police. Looking at um, Stacey's event 160, excuse me, 171C, is that... Is that just another close-up? That's just another of the same. All right. Um, 172. It's a closer view of the rod actually coming through the uh, headdress. Okay. And 173. And again, 174. 173 is also the very same thing. Uh, 74 is just, that's me actually holding it. Very unscientific, but just trying to tell a story. Now, you talked about not finding any shell casings. I want to go back to Stacey's Exhibit 167C for a moment. Now, when you were at the homicide um, cage, were you able to observe this um, vehicle in this condition as it is in this picture? Yes. Okay. How tall are you? About six one. <laughs> Looking at that photo and your personal observation of looking at that vehicle, are you able to fit in the backseat of that car? Yeah, it'd be crunched, but I'll be back there. All right. Now, when you got to the homicide cage, was this the condition that you found that vehicle? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Was there, do you know, or to your knowledge, were there items in the car prior to you seeing it at the homicide cage? Uh, on the 126 Cleveland Avenue address, there were three firearms that were of particular concern to me, which I had collected by the officer I delegated, or the detective, uh, Summer Beth, to collect. Do you recall... I'm going to show you. JW 158, 159, 160, and I believe it's going to be through 169. Sure. And I actually may need Mr. Kokomo.
JW Exhibit 157. Saying them, I mean, okay. <clears throat> and I wasn't, I wasn't looking for them. Honestly, I mean, I delegated that out. Um, had a lot going on. I just, those guns were of importance to me at the time. And this is the city that you delegated out to Summer Bay. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't do it all. You've got to depend on the people you work with to actually, you know, execute what you need them to do. Um, I'm in the fog of investigation. Uh, I need help, like anybody else. So I'm going to look at 157. Um, looking at Stacey Dillon 157, can you describe for the jury how that toolbox uh, is positioned? Is it laying flat on the seat or is it kind of raised up a little bit? It looks like the front end of it is on the seat and then it's propped up against the back of the back seat. It's and like the driver's side back seat. And is the blood underneath the toolbox? Yeah, I see some transfer of what appears to be blood, yeah. And to your knowledge, do you have any idea how the items got on the seat or those items were actually in the toolbox prior to this picture being taken? I don't know anything about that. All right. That's it. Thank you so much. Items such as that, would you have had those processed or taken to the GBI crime lab to be processed? I wouldn't. Why not? I didn't feel they were, they had anything to do with the case I was investigating, which the paramount concern is the officer's use of deadly force. Uh, I had a pretty working, I had a good idea of what happened in that scene. Uh, we don't just send arbitrary items to the GBI for testing. Uh, that's a call I made. They can blame me, but I didn't think they were relevant. Now, before we move on to the next what we testified, what you testified, what you testified so far is a couple of things. That when did this incident occur? 9-11-2013. During the course of your investigation, did you um, get jail calls in this case? I did. Okay. Tell us a little bit about what are jail calls. Jail calls are information stored on some server at the jail for anyone incarcerated that makes phone calls. Okay. And how, how does an individual who's incarcerated make those jail calls? Do they have a PIN number? What's the, what's the process? I don't know how they make the call, but I know how we can listen to them as law enforcement. Okay. How do you all listen to them as law enforcement? So there's an, there's, there's a, I guess it's an app that they gave us access to. When I say they, I'm talking about the police department, the Atlanta police. Uh, at that time, you could actually punch in and listen to people in real time almost with your cell phone. It was that far advanced. You could listen to specific conversations based off the name of the inmate. And when you listen to those calls, do you know if they are in an area called booking or if they are in general population? Are you able to determine that from the phone calls? I can't determine from where I sit. As I recall 10 years ago, 
I just know that usually when your people are talking, you can. Your Honor, cause of speculation. Have you had the occasion to have or listen to calls that individuals make when they first get into the jail? Uh, yes. Okay. And then listening to more calls once they've been in jail and maybe have gone to the general population? Yes. All right. Now, in this case, when did you pull jail calls in this case? For what date range? Well, I wanted 9-11. You know, that's the first significant data that sticks out that I wanted to see if there were any calls. At the time of 9-11, how many people out of the three that you said were detained were actually taken to the Fulton County Jail? Just one. Who was that? Adrian Bean. And did you pull the jail calls for Mr. Adrian Bean? I did. Um, when did you actually start listening to the jail calls? It was several days. I think around the 16th, if I'm not mistaken. Would you have put that date in your police report? Yes. We're looking at a copy of your police report help refresh your memory as to when you started listening to the Okay. Okay, is that yes? Yes. Okay. Exhibit 178C. Yeah, I recognize this as my supplementals. And is that a fair and accurate depiction of your supplementals regarding this case, um, the officer involved shooting? Yes, ma'am. And again, we're looking at a copy that helped refresh our memory as to the date in which you started listening to jail calls. Okay. And I'll specifically direct your attention to page 30 of 47. At the top and at the bottom, she might say 42. She said 47. 30 of 47. 30 of 47. And I apologize, it might be 32 of 47. This is, this one, for whatever reason, is out of order. Went back to 20. Let me see, hold on, hold on. It might be me, hold on. User error, I'm sorry, hold on, here we go. Yeah, 9, 16, 13. When you started listening, when you started listening to jail calls on 9 16 13, did you get calls that were in between these days? I don't remember. I just re I don't remember that. Would it be safe to say that any calls you would have heard to would have had to happen before you listened to oh, that? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So roughly between 9 11. In preparation for this case today, have you had an opportunity to listen to some of those jail calls that you pulled back in September of 2013? Yes, ma'am, I have. And in listening to those calls, are they a fair and accurate depiction of the calls that you pulled back in September of 2013? Yes, ma'am. And did there appear to be any additions or deletions to those calls that were made? that you um, pulled back in September 2013? No. Right. Your Honor, at this time, the state would like to um, show um, Detective Quinn takes it to 175, which contains calls A through C. Um, Your Honor, State's Exhibit 175 A was already admitted yesterday. State's Exhibit, sorry, 175 Charlie Alpha was already admitted yesterday, Your Honor. What is State's Exhibit 175 Charlie Bravo 
is actually a duplication of Defense Exhibit 205. So they've already been admitted. The other three calls, Your Honor, will be new exhibits, which would be Stacey Exhibits 175, Charlie, Delta, Echo. Yes, 175, Charlie Alpha through Echo. Any So I didn't know you were putting it in. So when he listened to them last week, it was prior to me knowing you were putting it in. So I had already labeled it. I did identify two of the three that are the newer calls that have not been admitted. I identify one, and I'll call it, for the purposes of this, the chicken call, because it stands out because she's talking about cooking fried chicken. The second call after that is a call where she's at the baseball game, and that's very identifiable. It is the third call that I advise that I will, um, 
I would ask the court if we could take a brief break so I could just identify which call that is so that they can know. But I've identified that two of the three calls. Do you have any objections to the baseball or the chicken call? Right, Your and I will say for the third call, Your Honor, really as it relates to this particular incident, there's only two relevant areas from zero zero to one minute, and then three fifth three minutes and fifty seconds to six forty are the only relevant parts, I believe, for this particular are you gonna matter. Want all calls? Are you gonna want all of the third calls to be to be played? Yes, Your So all the calls, um, Mr. Steele is correct. All the calls are approximately 15 minutes, and the state does intend to play all five calls. Come back. We'll just want to know a decision about the transcript because we do have a transcript for the first call, and that was the one we gave to him yesterday. So just a decision. About well, I thought you were going to take more time for that because. Oh, they, so they have not looked at it. Okay, never mind. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Okay. We're in recess about twenty. Minutes. I have a motion. I have a motion. In regards to what, sir? Your comment. I have oh. a motion. Okay. What's your motion? This is the second time that this honorable court in front of the jury has addressed me inappropriately and wrongly. Second time. The first time I gave the state discovery of a song from a Super Bowl 
weeks before, there was an objection. You assumed that I didn't give it to the state. I didn't want to embarrass the court. So you were yelling at me and saying, do you understand me? Do you understand me? And instead of saying, do you understand that you're wrong? I sat here and I said, yes, your honor. That was to protect the integrity of this courtroom and the court. Now you say in front of the jury how unprepared I am. I am not unprepared for anything. Okay, I Mr. Have, Mr. No, no, no. Steele. I need to make Mr. a record. Wait, Your Honor, Mr. Steele, wait a second. When you keep delaying, okay, and that's what that's what's happening to the court. You keep delaying and, and elongating and, and and pushing out these particular our bil ability to 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 present a seamless case in front of the jury. That's my purview as a judge. And I've asked you a number of times, you and your colleagues on both sides, to go ahead and listen to the whatever it is you need to do. Prepare me as needed. Now, I asked you those two particular questions because if you've, if they turned over the, the audio to you in discovery and you've listened to them already, then you either have an objection or you don't have an objection. And I was trying to solicit from you whether or not we could just go ahead and, and just hear it. So you can imagine my frustration because all these little delays just elongate out the whole, the whole our presentation in front of the jury. That's for your benefit, not for mine, Your Honor. So, so that's why I keep. That's why I, I've, I've, I've told you all at various times during this particular case. It's not because I want to embarrass you, Mr. Steele. It's just that I'm trying to kind of keep this thing presented in a way that the jury can listen to it. And, and the court is wrong. Okay, what happened? What? Let me finish. And I'm making this for the record. What happened is, and, and I don't get embarrassed by you, but I don't want to embarrass you. I made an objection that some of these jail calls have a third party who will not testify. I objected to hearsay. The state said it explains the effect. Okay, which, on, no, which, no, no, call, which call? Which so, call? These calls, as you Okay, as well, you, then why, weren't we, why aren't we taking them up beforehand? The state just said... Just now, these are the three additional calls that they want to okay, introduce. Okay, all right. Well, then is, here, here's here's your response. I'm going to give you an acceptable response. Well, I'm going Judge, to make hold my on. motion. Huh? I need to make my motion. Judge, there's more to this, and we need to listen to these calls. Right. Then I would have no. You didn't say that though. So I would. So um, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. But that's, that's why I keep telling you this. Okay. I mean, like I told you, forewarned judge, a happy judge. All right, so had you just told me up front, Judge, we have not had the opportunity to listen to all of those calls. We've only been able to listen to two. I want to listen to the other ones. And I've listened to the calls. I know, I don't know what the third one they're trying okay, to Okay, well, but listen, let me just finish. So you presuppose I don't know what the calls are. Well, I don't know what the third call is because Ms. Hilton, who's professional, said, I'll take a break and I'll let you know what it is. But the other two calls are the baseball game and at a chicken, they're talking, discussing chicken wings, I un, or chicken. I understand those calls. There's issues in those calls that you need to address. But I politely make an objection and say, Your Honor, based upon what you told me, which is what you told me, we'll take it up later. I wanted to raise it. You tell in front of the jury how unprepared I am. And let me tell you something. I am not unprepared. I don't appreciate the court telling me that. And you don't, and, and I ask you, Tell the jurors that you okay. were wrong when you when you admonished me last time. You said you wouldn't do that. This is the second time. And you know what it does to me? I don't care. I, I'm hurt because you're a court, but I really don't care. But what does it do to Mr. Williams? Mr. Steele, I'm not trying to personally insult you or hurt your feelings, okay? You are, you. you are a grown professional advocate. I am a grown professional jurist. And people say things to me that border on the, border on the lines of I could take action or not. You have certainly said some of those things to me during the trial of this case. I have let them go. So, sir, um, I, you know, that's, just, even that's just that's just the trial. That's just the trial of the case. OK, no, but, but that man's life is here. And, and, you, and, and you know, him. you're doing a fine job in representing him. Well, but you know what? That's that's just uh, that's just the way we are right now. But the, the crux of the issue is Mr. Steele and and the representatives from the state and everybody else. What happens right now is I have to take a break 
in order to vet all of these issues, which I'm required to do, Mr. Steele. And that's what is kind of disappointing to me because I have given you all this administrative time, all these th breaks to go ahead and do this, and this is what delays the presentation of this case in front of the jury. You know, if I would have done what the state did and I'm not poking anything at, the, at Ms. Hilton, you would have said to me, why didn't you share those calls with him before? What, you were out all day today. We didn't start court till 1 o'clock. I would have shared them. I know but, you would have. But, but the state didn't. I'm not poking fun because I can deal with it. But well, well, you know what? Then but but in. here's the problem. You I have a problem. I have a problem with it because here's at, at the end of the day, I got to listen to a 15 minute call. You don't have to listen to anything, but you have to make a ruling. Yes, on but I have to listen to it in order to make the ruling on those. And even if you said you've listened to the chicken call and the baseball call, and if you say there's other issues that come come into play, it's better for us to take those things up before I ask for that jury. And I could have done that. This morning, I could have done that at another point in time. So, I mean, well, I raised this issue to you, and I don't remember the date, but it was days ago. I raised it, and the court said, all right, understood, and we'll take that issue up when it comes. Now, okay. what am I supposed to do? Okay. Sit there and say no okay. objection? No, no, exactly no, no. Not right. at all. Not I said, all. judge, it's an issue Not we need all. to take up. Not at all. And in addition to that, today alone, and this happens... Today alone, the state introduced two exhibits. I've never been given them before, ever. You know what I did? No problem. No problem. Because I think that's professional. One was a Google map. It needs to be clarified for the record that it was not done on, October, on September 11, 2013. And then a map with little dots with, with, with um, t um, 0.4 miles I've never seen before. But I didn't do anything, Your Honor. I Mr. want to move the case. But when the court, it, it gives me no pleasure in saying this. I believe that this honorable court is biased against Mr. Williams and or his counsel. And I ask you to consider recusing yourself or don't do this again to me. This is inappropriate to me. I respect you, but what am I supposed to do? Sit there? While you do this, I didn't do anything wrong. I did exactly what you teach me to do and okay. the courts teach me to do. All right. But instead, no, no, I got to finish this. Then I get told to this court, this court says by prosecutor love that I'm not being candid with the court and I'm misrepresenting because Mr. Bean never went to the hospital at Grady on September 11, 2013. And Miss Love has a document on the desk to prove it. I sat right in front of your honor at the, at the table, at the bench, and I said, I'd be careful what you say. That's not accurate. Ms. Love looked down on me, and she said, it is accurate. You said, we'll take a break, figure it out. After the break, you didn't even bat an eye. Ms. Love said, yeah, I was totally wrong. Mr. Steele's right. He was taking a Grady. If I would have done that and called another member of the bar disingenuous, not truthful, no candor, and misrepresenting, you would have had me yelling in front of a jury. You did nothing. You didn't even ask Miss Love to apologize. I don't want her apology. I don't care about Miss Love, but I care about the court. And now if you can walk in someone else's shoes just for a minute and see what you're doing to Mr. Williams, because it's hurtful. I'm not the one wasting time. I'm here every day ready to go. I am not wasting the time. I make a motion to ask you to please recuse yourself. I know it has to be in writing within five days. If you want me to do that, I'll do it. And that's to go to another judge. But this is what's going on, Your Honor, whether you see it or not. You're yelling at me in front of a jury for nothing. And then you won't apologize. And I did nothing wrong ever Mr. on these Steele, occasions I'm gonna, or others. I'm going to go ahead and address your motion at this point in time. I'm going to deny your motion at this point in time. Um, And also just direct you that I have the responsibility to control the proceedings in these particular in this particular circumstance. Sometimes uh, things get kind of kind of heated, and that's kind of what that's the crucible and trial um, of any particular case. I am not in any way in, in intimating or insinuating that you are not professional, you are not prepared, but. The things that I am bringing up to both of you, and I have, I have fussed at both sides for this particular issue of not being prepared in the sense of, and the only reason it, 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 it affects the trial of the case is it makes the proceedings a lot longer than they should be. 
because all these things could be taken up. And sometimes if we've got to parse out all these things, as you can see right now, it takes time. And, they, and that's what I'm kind of concerned about having been a jurist for a long time. So um, I understand that you're a zealous advocate. Um, you in no way offend me by, by raising any type of motion. Uh, I think you're doing a, I think that you are represent you and the others here are representing your clients well, but sir, I, I have to be able to control these proceedings. And you at times in these proceedings have not listened to what the courts told you. And I certainly could have explored other options. I didn't. So I'll tell you that much to, for what it's worth. You but, allowed a member of the bar yesterday, ask a witness who constantly is committing respectfully, potentially perjury. Did Mr. Steele shut off and turn on the recording? I never did that. I wouldn't do that, and I didn't do that. Okay, and, but I sir, that's a, that's let a, me, let me sir, sir, that's a, I would have said that question to about another member of the bar, prosecution. You would have come over the bench and said, how dare you? I, I sat there and I said, outrageous. You okay, deny the motion. I but, think three other people made motions to strike or to object. You deny that. Judge, I'm just telling you the appearance, if not the reality, is not good here. I'm, I'm being... What, involved. to who? To Mr. Williams. Okay, but... It's, Maybe he, to the others. Maybe You're, his, you're, you're right. his advocate, okay? And that, that, to, that separate issue of whether or not you did what you did, the state accused you, uh, the state accused you of that, they have the right to at least inquire about whether or not that particular, that happened. Now, whether or not it happened or not, I'm not making any comment on it, but it goes to bias, it goes to mis motives to misrepresent. So, so but, but, that but, never happened. No but, good okay, but I'm, I'm, not me, I'm not commenting, I'm not commenting on that. That's for I, the jury to, that's for the, that's for the jury to decide. I asked the question about a missing recording that I wasn't given of a statement made by Mr. Bean, and I know you told me. And I keep telling you. Know you told me? You said, if, does the state have it? They said, no. You said, nothing I can do. I tried to cross on it. You sustained an objection. Because it doesn't exist at this point in time. Now, if it exists at some point, I will, I told you I'd say it. One, I'd tell you, I, I, I apologize to you. And then two, I'll take corrective action on, on, Honor. against the party or, or the entity that um, failed to give you that particular it, statement. But the point is, Everyone knows he spoke to the detective but beforehand. We don't, no, we don't. That's he only said it. You believe it. You honestly believe it. And that's, that's, and that's true. On September okay, 17th, 2013, on recording, Mr. Bean tells that to Detective Quinn. How is that far-fetched? Why would he ever say that? I lied to the other detective. Why would he ever say that? I mean, logic has to come into this courtroom at times. But you stop me from doing it, but you allow another lawyer make up that I'm stopping and starting a recording. And he says, well, I, I, don't, I don't recall. Well, I don't they, remember I, anything. I, here's the thing. They're, 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 that's why I probably miss, miss Love asked me to put it under seal for the time being. But, I mean, I'm not saying anything. But if true, that's a pretty, that's a pretty serious accusation. If, if, true, if true, I'll die right now. How about that, Judge Glanville? Your Honor, I object to this. I don't care about her objection. I'm and, speaking with Your the Honor, court. Your Honor, I object. I'm I'd speaking like to with the objection. court. Okay. I'm right. speaking Let with the court. Let him finish, and then you can uh, then you can state your. My point is, if you don't see what's going on, it's because you're not viewing it out of the lens but, but of Mr. a Steele, juror. Mr. Steele, I can't do that. I have to. I have to be the referee. It's so the jury decides those particular issues of, of believability and credibility. Now, I'm not getting into the throes of the throes of war between you and the between you and the state. That's your business, and that I is have certainly nothing to do with the throw uh, war. No, but I mean, it's your ability as an advocate. Oh, I don't. I told talk. you before. That's your ability as an advocate. All right. What I'm saying is. You said in front of this jury, I was unprofessional. I am not unprofessional. You were wrong. I think at that particular point in time, given the totality of what happened, that's what the court's assessment was. Sir, I, I am... But it was wrong. It's, it's, it's a snippet in time. Mr. Steele, you're a, you're a very good attorney, but I'm a professional jurist, and you may not like some of the rulings that I make, and you may not like like the way that, the way that the uh, trial is going 
at a particular point in time. That, that's for all advocates. Ms. Love and, and her colleagues, I've, I've told them the same thing. But I think that, you know, my job as the referee is to give you a fair, a fair trial. And that's, that's what, what I'm, I'm going to do. Well, I hope that's true. But you just told the jury I'm unprepared. And I am prepared. I don't understand why you would say that. Both of you, I, and, and I'll level this against the state, both of you, that's being unprepared because that, 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 I have to, I have to then listen to, listen to this to rule on it. I understand, but I'm the only one that the jurors here, the court, take ire with. Ever. Without an apology, without Oh, I've, I've taken, I think I've taken Ms. Love and Ms. Hilton and uh, her colleagues to task many times. No, I've heard you yell. I, I, oh, I've, I've taken them to task as well. I've heard you say to her, stop interrupting me. Answer oh, that's, that's taking them to task? The jurors never heard that. Ever. <clears throat> so, I, um, I ask for a continuing recusal motion. I, I know it's not in writing, but I assume that you're, you're, uh, you're ruling on it right now. That's what you're saying. Well, when you got to put it in writing, but I mean, I'll, I'll rule on it at this point in time. I'm going to deny the, I'm going to deny the motion, but you, you need to put it in writing if that's what you wish to do. Uh, and, uh, and I'll appropriate. I'm also asking for a mistrial based upon your statements. I think I made that clear, but I'm asking for a mistrial. Okay. Now, I, Ms. Love. A fair, I don't think it's a fair forum for Mr. Williams. Okay. And I don't want to ask for a mistrial, but I have no choice when the court is saying what it said that I've, I'm not going to repeat it in front of a jury, that's hurtful. And I'm not saying me. I mean, regardless of what I think of it, it's hurtful to Mr. Williams getting a fair trial. All right, Mr. Steele, in terms of what, in terms of, you know, what, what I've told you all already, we still have, or we're still going through the, you know, I, I've told you all, both sides have told you. So, this just delays the trial. I mean, where I've got to rule upon other things. Well, I made this motion whenever I made it, and I raised it, and you said we'll get to it. Yeah, but you know, but you know, it's timing. I mean, did you raise it when we first got in here this afternoon? Did you raise it yesterday? Did you raise it kind of so I could so I could kind of take it at that point in time? None of you did. If I would have been told that there were going to be three additional jail calls, I could have raised it. The two others are already in. I didn't object. All right. Okay. All right. Ms. Love? Your Honor, um, just the state would ask that the court deny the motion for mistrial. The state has provided to the defense these jail calls. We have actually requested more than once um, what portions are objectionable, what portions do they not want us to play. We have sent them to the defense in a format that they can listen to them offline without having to have the actual CDN. We have had them converted for them. The objection that we got initially was put to the call that Mr. Steele essentially um, put in by playing the call, the recording of the interview that Detective Quinn did with Adrian Bean. And the whole, the whole jail recording that was played during that interview was State's Exhibit 175, Charlie Alpha. So the portion that they initially said that they objected to, that third party portion, and we had a motion on it, they actually introduced by playing the call, um, the interview with Detective Quinn. We have, I have said to them, I'm certain that Ms. Hilton has communicated with them via email, that we are using the jail calls. And I know I personally have asked, what do you object to? So at this point, I, I'm not certain why there is this motion um, I object to the language that um, is used. I'll die if the court does this, Your Honor. Um, the court is well aware of the times that the state has received reprimand, both in front of and out of the presence of the jury. I'm not certain where that's coming from. I would ask that the court, of course, the court has already ruled, but the um, notion that there is a bias, um, I, I'm not certain even where that's coming from, given um, the amount of tongue lashings we've received from the court on the state side. So I would just object to um, the defendant being granted a mistrial. Um, and I state for the record that the portion that they identified for us that they objected to regarding the jail calls was entered through their cross-examination of the witness, Adrian B. Um, thank you. 
What about the, the, the sealed document? Mr. Mr. Steele is uh, raised um, or made an issue of at this point. With relation to the sealed document, that was a memorandum of, a, of the interaction that a lieutenant with the district attorney's office um, had um, with a party as it relates to Mr. Steele's interaction with that party um, unsolicited uh, after walking out of from the stand uh, that party made comments to members of the district attorney's office. The state uh, asked that party, and we did not, we did not assume facts that were not in evidence. We asked, unlike the question, um, why did you do this or why did you do that, which would assume facts that were not in evidence, we asked the open-ended question with a good faith basis for doing so and with an ability to impeach if there was a denial um, of having said it. So we didn't make that up out of whole cloth. Um, we wanted to make certain that all parties on the defense side had that <coughs> random. Um, and frankly, Your Honor, I think it is improper for anyone, for certainly any member of the bar, to stand up during the cross-examination, direct examination, and offer testimony essentially to a jury. So for Mr. Steele to stand up, in the middle of my redirect of Adrian Bean and to say that did not occur or preposterous or outlandish is completely improper, disrespectful. The state has done nothing of the sort and we would ask that Mr. Steele be reprimanded for doing so and the court rightly did so and to have him ask for an apology after he has been blatantly uh, improperly acting before the jury I, I don't know what else I could say. I would just ask that the court um, admonish uh, counsel for testifying during trial. I have given the state, uh, the court, the basis for the questions that I've asked, and I've never asked a question that assumes facts that are not in evidence. Unlike the question, why did you? Did you know that? Do you recall that? I didn't phrase my questions like that because I know not to do that. And I'm not going to do that. And I don't want to improperly give the jury an impression of something that exists or that will be shown that I can't show them. So there is a real clear distinction in what Mr. Steele asked, implying, you know, why did you give a statement at the hospital? And he keeps conflating what it is that is objectionable. He keeps asserting something so that everybody in the ethos is asking, oh, where is this interview? Where is this recording? He's never seen one. He doesn't have a good faith basis for asking for one. And yet he continues to put that question out there so that everyone in the universe has this idea, oh, the state is hiding something. Oh, the state destroyed evidence. Again, they sat there for a whole day asking witnesses about the destruction of evidence. That was, there was no evidence that anybody destroyed any evidence, yet they stood there a whole day and asked someone about that. And then he asks a witness on the stand under the guise of impeaching him, do you recall that or didn't this happen or can you explain why the state would delete or can you explain why the state failed to record your interview at the hospital? And he has no information that an interview at the hospital exists. So <laughs> all of that, Your Honor, I, I don't know if Mr. Steele wants, you know, to give an impression. I don't know. He's vigorously advocating for his client. That's what he is supposed to do. But I would ask that the court deny all of his motions. They are baseless. And I would ask, um, you know, I've taken my licks from the court. We all have. And I, I, I'd ask that the court deny the motion for recusal. You know, I mean, the court has made rulings that Obviously, the state hasn't agreed with. The court has made rulings that other people haven't agreed with. So this notion that somehow the court is biased, <laughs> when as recently as a few days ago, I caught it hardest. It was played everywhere. I'd ask that the court just deny Mr. Steele's motions, all of them, out of hand. All right. Um, Ms. Hilton, do you, do, you have, do you have any explanation as to why this third call was just disclosed today? Is that true? Then Mr. Steele, is Mr. Steele correct? No, he is not, Your Honor. These calls have been turned over. So, as a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to send an email to forward an email to defense counsel that shows when they asked us to have the calls converted because they could not hear it on a CD, they asked us to have these calls converted. Literally on January 5th, and I'm getting ready to, I'm actually in the process of forwarding these calls. Mr. Smith sent these calls on January 5th, all of them. I believe a few weeks ago, this is the email that I'm looking for. When this case was first going to happen, probably in December, 
when we were talking, when we were to disclose to defense counsel what uh, media we were going to use, I believe in one of those emails, and that is what I am looking for, I told defense counsel, we're going to use all of the jail recordings. So this is not a surprise to them that we're using the jail calls. Um, the only call that has ever been objected to is the first call that was played yesterday. They have not made an objection to any call. Now, they just want to know which of the eight calls this is. Then the state has no problem to do that. But to say that they just received the calls or they just learned about the calls, that is not true. They've known about the calls. Now, for me to identify this last call, I can do that. But And I'm going to look for the email, or it might have been conversation in court, but when they ask, what media will you use? I think I said, we're going to use all the jail calls. And we're not actually using all the jail calls. We're going to use five of them. So this is not new evidence for defense counsel. Can I, can I, can I respond? Um, what, sir? About the, the and, and maybe this will give a path moving forward that's a little bit more efficient, hopefully. Um, there are thousands of jail calls in this case. De so, Your Honor, hold on, hold on, hold not on. Not for this case, for okay. Acts 5 okay. to 7 but, specifically. Okay. There are thousands of jail calls for this case. So they, yes, they gave about 10, 12, however many jail calls. They're saying, I'm not going to dispute that. I don't have my computer in front of me. But it seems very inefficient to me that we're going to litigate and you want us, the defense, to raise our objections to thousands or even 12 jail calls and suggest redactions for all these jail calls. But when, how long, when did you get the jail calls? When did they tell you? Didn't they tell you like within a week or two, so, like I asked before, so, that they were going to use these calls? So, Your Honor, they just identified one as the chicken call. That's not how they are in discovery. So there's a cross-reference number. So we need to know exactly what call by the, the cross-reference number in discovery. There's nothing labeled okay, chicken call. Your, there's your, nothing. Your, all right, but there's and, all, listen, is there only, is there a certain number of calls for this particular type, for this particular act or acts? I mean, yes or no? I, I can't, I don't have the email in front of me. So, yes. yes, okay, so there's how many, eight, ten calls, how many? Your Honor, there's actually eight calls, and two of them were duplicates, and so in the okay, email so, that I broke down so, to them. So, 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 you, so in preparation, you know that if, you, if this particular act, which we've been dealing with for weeks, you only got about 12 calls to, 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 so, to listen to, right? So, yes, so you would like us to proactively um, I, state our objections for every call in litigate could because they're not using every call only if it becomes an issue because if you all work it out that's fine i don't have any issue with that but if it's going to be an issue then i need to be able to vet it i gotta listen to the call i gotta listen to the evidentiary basis as to why it should be admitted or or not admitted that just gives me time to do that and if if you say it's only going to take about 15 minutes or whatever, well, it may take longer than that. You see how long we've been out dealing with this issue? I, I, so, I mean, so that's what I mean by forewarned judge is a happy judge. So if we could take it up and I don't have to either have them sit in their headquarters, it's better for all of you. I do not dispute mm -hmm. anything you're saying, Your Honor. All I'm doing is suggesting that if last night or, or yesterday <coughs> we were told tomorrow we plan on playing this call and it wasn't the chicken call or the whatever call, Baseball. it was whatever whatever the number is in the discovery or on the email, then we would certainly, I, I would say it would be on us. But that's not exactly what happened. I just want you on, and I'm not trying to, I'm, I really like Miss Hilton a lot, so I'm not even trying to argue with her or say she's done anything wrong. It's just, um, I think if we know a little bit in advance and it's not just, oh, the chicken <laughs> call, then we would be in a better position to lodge our objections to you. Because right now they are, I, I assume they're getting the cross-reference numbers, so then I can bring those numbers to the defense table so we can pull up the exact calls that they want us to review. So that's kind of, I just wanted Your Honor to understand it's not as simple as just we didn't listen to the chicken call. Your Honor, if I may respond briefly. Uh, no, Mr. Um, Williams, I believe, filed a motion in limine number 40. That was the only motion in limine that we had as it related to a jail call. And that was objecting to the third party information contained in jail call number 175, Charlie Alpha. Again, that Mr. Steele introduced by playing the interview of Detective, uh, that Detective Quinn conducted with Adrian B. So we have again turned over the eight we can specifically 
give track one, two, three, four, or five of CD one, two, or three. We can give that information to them. Um, the way that Ms. Hilton and <coughs> Atkins noted and time hacked each of these calls references specific information in the call. That is the only reason um, Ms. Hilton um, identified it as such. But there were eight calls. There is no other call within which the information she has um, spoken to the court and described the call using, um, there's no other call that has that information out of the only eight. So I'm not certain the reason for the reference to thousands of jail calls um, in this particular context. But, Your Honor, we have eight jail calls here. We've turned over. We've asked, what do you object to? And the only thing that we've gotten was motion limiting of 40 from Defendant Williams. All right. Anything else before we recess? I still got to allow you to listen to the phone calls. Okay. The facts got lost. The accurate facts, I, I, I've listened to all the calls, the relevant calls. I've listened to them all. I know what the chicken call is. I know what the baseball call is. The issue is there's third parties making statements of fact, introducing statement of fact. We argued this. The state's position was it's non-hearsay because it goes to the effect of Mr. Bean, who will be a witness. I dispute that. I believe it's hearsay. That was the issue. Yes. You said, we'll take it up. Yeah. That's it. I'm not saying I, I don't understand the parameters. The only call that had <laughs> issue is Madam President, District Attorney Hilton said, I don't remember what the third call is. I'll let you know on a break. I was comfortable with that. But I just want you, before these jail calls are being played, to make a ruling, because I waive it. I need to hear, I need to hear the call, though. Exactly. Okay. That's right. what, that was my objection. That was it. And, and I did it in a manner that I thought was appropriate to say that we raised it. Your Honorable Court told me to let you know. And then we got here. All right. All right, um, N-105? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Um, they're both uh, denied. I'll note your objection and the continuing objection, Mr. Harvey. Thank you. All right, we're going to take, uh, did you have something, sir? Okay, we're going to take 15 minutes so we can you can listen to the call, and uh, we'll come back at that point in time, okay? All right, we're in recess.